Loving Father in heaven, we humbly bow before you this morning to thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word. And we realize, Lord, how much in need we are of your wisdom and your spirit. And so we pray that you would be here with us to help us understand what we read and discuss today. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two days in the New Testament that stand side by side, each claimed by Christians today as the Sabbath of the Christian church. They are the last and the first days of the week. There's a minority group that claims that the seventh day is still the Lord's Sabbath. And there's the majority group who hold that the first day of the week is the Sabbath for Christians. But how does the matter of these two days stand in the New Testament? That's what we want to know. Because what some minister or theologian says is just not good enough. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And so we want to make sure that what we believe and practice is indeed what God has said. One interesting observation among many is that the first day of the week is mentioned only eight times in the New Testament, never once being spoken of as the Sabbath, as a day of rest, or as a sacred day. It's simply called the first day of the week. On the other hand, inspiration gives the seventh day of the week the sacred title of the Sabbath 59 times in the New Testament alone. So, what I'd like to do is take a look at these eight texts which mention the first day of the week to see if they somehow prove that Sunday should be observed as a sacred day, or as a day of rest from labor, or as a special day of worship. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, God says, Come now and let us reason together. And I hope that's what we can do as we study this subject this morning. The first text we want to look at in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Here in this verse, two days are mentioned. One is called the Sabbath, and the other, the day following it, is called the first day of the week. Now, which of these two days do you suppose would be the Sabbath for Christians to observe? Is it the one that is called the first day of the week? Or is it the day which inspired Christian writers writing for the benefit of people during the Christian dispensation called the Sabbath? The answer is obvious, isn't it? And by the way, this was written after Jesus rose from the dead. And so Matthew, writing several years after the resurrection, still called the day before the first day of the week the Sabbath. The next four texts are very similar to the one we just read and speak of the same event. Let's just read them quickly. The first one is in Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. Mark 16 and verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices, that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Look at verse 9 also. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. The next one we want to look at is Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. Luke 24, 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, 
and certain others with them. And also the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now, after reading five of the eight first day texts, is there anything so far that would indicate that the first day of the week holds any significant importance? No, nothing at all. We've taken the time to read them simply because they are five of the eight. But there's nothing here to show that there's something special about the first day of the seven-day weekly cycle. The sixth text is found in John chapter 20 and verse 19. John chapter 20 and verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Many Sunday advocates believe that the disciples met on the day of the resurrection to commemorate the event as a day to be set aside for coming together for worship, and that Jesus sanctioned this meeting by uniting with them. But is that what this verse says? Not at all. You would have to have quite an imagination to get that out of this text. At this particular time, the disciples didn't even believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So they couldn't have been meeting for that reason. Let's back up and read the previous verse to get the context. John chapter 20 and verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Now let's connect what John says with what Mark says about the same event. Mark chapter 16. Beginning with verse 9. Mark 16, beginning with verse 9. We already read verse 9 a few moments ago, but we'll read it again, as well as verses 10 through 14. Mark 16, 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, what? Believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not that them which had seen him after he was risen. So Jesus reproved his disciples for their unbelief and according to the verse we just read in John 20:19. What was the reason they had shut themselves in the upper room? For fear of the Jews. They weren't meeting together for worship or in honor of the resurrection at all. Except for Mary Magdalene and Cleopas and his friend that Jesus talked with on the road to Emmaus, the rest of the disciples were still mourning Jesus' death and didn't believe Mary when she told them that she had seen the Lord. The seventh text is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. 
And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Was this a Sunday communion service in honor of Christ's resurrection? Or was it something else? First of all, the communion service does not commemorate the resurrection. It commemorates the crucifixion of the Lord. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. He says, For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And so the communion service has nothing to do with the resurrection. It commemorates the crucifixion of the Lord. Now let's continue reading in Acts chapter 20. Go back to Acts chapter 20, and we'll continue reading there, beginning with verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching... He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while even till the break of day, so he departed. Notice, it says, so he departed. This was a night meeting that took place after the Sabbath hours were over, on what we would today call Saturday night. Because according to Leviticus 23.32, the Sabbath was to be kept from evening to evening, or from sundown to sundown. That's also why Genesis 1 says, and the evening and the morning were the first day the second day, the third day, and so on. The days of creation week began on the dark part of the day. And so here's what happened. The people met together on the Sabbath, as they were accustomed to do, and Paul was a little long-winded and preached until midnight, which would be the first day of the week by then, because the new day started at sundown. And Eutychus got tired, nodded off, and fell out the window. Then after Eutychus was raised up, they all went back upstairs and continued the meeting till the break of day, or till what we would call Sunday morning. And if you'll continue reading the chapter, you'll find that Paul's companions took a ship to Asos, while Paul decided to walk the 35 miles and met them there in the city later. Also, as I was looking at what newer translations say about Acts 20 and verse 7, I found that some say plainly that this was a Saturday night meeting and that Paul departed on Sunday morning. And here's another thing about the breaking of bread. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 46, it says the disciples broke bread every day. And so there was nothing significant about breaking bread on the first day of the week, or any other day for that matter. So, the disciples didn't meet together because the first day of the week held any significance. They met together because Paul was getting ready to leave. It's just that simple. It was a farewell meeting that took place in the evening and through the night because they had worshipped together during the Sabbath hours and were loath to separate from Paul, as they knew he would be leaving them. So as the Apostle Paul took that 35-mile hike on Sunday morning, he gives us an example for regular weekly labor on the first day of the week. All right, the eighth and last first day text in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, 
Let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Many Sunday keepers say this text is proof that the Corinthian church met on the first day of the week because they took up an offering, when exactly the opposite is true. The text says everyone was to lay by him in store. The phrase by him in Greek means by himself. In English, this is equivalent to at home. In other words, at the beginning of each week, everyone was to begin to store up an offering at home, so when Paul came by, it could be collected and distributed to the poor in Jerusalem. That's all it says. So there's nothing in this verse, or in any of the other verses we've examined this morning, that would attach any kind of sacredness to the first day of the week. If there had been any sacredness placed upon Sunday as a day of rest and worship for Christians today, it can't be found in God's Word. It's just not there. Therefore, we must look elsewhere. But I'm really not interested in looking elsewhere this morning because we did that last time. If you didn't receive the sermon CD titled, Are You Fooled by a Myth? Let me know and I'll send you one because that one will tell you when and how Sunday sacredness came to be and who's responsible for bringing it into the Christian church. According to Bible prophecy, one of these days in the not too distant future, everyone in this world will have the opportunity to choose between the commandments of God or the commandments of men in order to receive either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. But you and I have the opportunity today to make the choice to plant our feet on a path that will place the seal of God in our foreheads. And I encourage you to make the right choice this morning. I know this is a big decision for many people to make, but I have to ask, Will you choose to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy when the rest of the world honors another day? How about if the government threatens to confiscate your property and threaten you with imprisonment? What about when a death decree goes forth? Will you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy then? You see, friends, it's more than a matter of two days. It's a matter of two loyalties. It's a matter of obedience and disobedience, righteousness and unrighteousness, heaven or hell, eternal life or eternal death. But, oh, Pastor Jones, do you really think people are going to go to hell because of the day they choose to go to church? Does God really care that much about a day? Is he going to blot my name out of the book of life because I want to continue to go to church on Sunday to fellowship with my family and friends like I've done all my life? Well, let me ask you this, friend. Was it a big deal when God told Adam and Eve not to eat of a certain tree in the midst of the garden? It was just another tree, wasn't it? Was there anything wrong with the fruit? Not to my knowledge. Did it really make that much difference whether or not they obeyed that simple request? Did they have to know all the whys and wherefores and consequences of that choice before they lovingly obeyed? Or would it have been best for them and us to just do what God said? I think you'll agree with me that it was a big deal. And the principle of the day God asks us to keep holy isn't really any different, is it? Shouldn't we just do what God asks us to do because he knows best and might have a good reason behind the request? It's really pretty simple when you think about it. He just wants us to learn to trust him. And we show our trust by doing what he says. But, you might say, if I decide to keep the Sabbath, I'll lose my job. And you know what? You just might. The real question is, do I trust God enough that he will fulfill his promise 
to supply my needs if I put him first in my life? Do you remember what Jesus said to those who were afraid they would come to want if they obeyed God? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, food, shelter, clothing, will be added unto you. There was a time in my life when I had to make this kind of decision. I was working in a factory in California nearly 40 years ago where I ran into a problem as a new Christian. The Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart and I knew that I could not continue to work there and still be able to keep God's commandments. And so I made the decision to turn in my notice that very Wednesday and that that would be my last day of work not knowing where I was going to find another job. I had a family to support at that time, and it wasn't an easy decision for me to make. But I took God at his word and decided to trust him to take care of my needs. And you know what? He did. Within a week, I had another job with better pay and a much more enjoyable work environment. What God has promised he is able to perform. God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. If you have enough faith to accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme in your life, you will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before your feet. This has been my experience, and I'm no one special. God will do the same for you. You might have to be patient and wait on the Lord, but he will come through if you only trust and obey. Did I just sit back and do nothing to find another job, expecting God to rain down $20 bills from heaven to supply my needs? No. I did what I could on my part, and God did what I could not do. And that's always a winning combination. We have to cooperate with God in our own salvation, and it's no different with all the affairs of life. Humanity and divinity combined will accomplish what humanity alone can never do. And so I hope this gives you courage to step out in faith in whatever you may be facing. And remember, the waters of the Jordan didn't part until the feet of the priests carrying the ark stepped into the water. When we take the step of faith, then God will work for us, friends. That is his promise. Before we close, I'd like to give you a snapshot of coming events as they relate to our subject today. Because without a doubt, we are living in the last days of this earth's history. And God doesn't want us to be caught off guard to the things that will shortly take place. And there's no reason to be caught off guard because the information we need to be prepared has been made known to us through the sure word of prophecy. As disrespect for God's law becomes more open and manifest in this world, and that's happening right before our eyes today, as this happens, the line of demarcation between those who obey the law of God and those who don't will become more distinct. As things develop, love for God's commandments will increase with one class as contempt for them increases in another. And believe me, friends, this crisis is fast approaching. The time for God's visitation is soon to come. Just because God is loving and not willing that any should perish and slow to anger and all that, doesn't mean that he will not punish. In fact, in Luke 18 and verse 8, Jesus said he will, and that he will do it speedily. You see, when God has done everything he can do to save every person, the end will come very quickly, because he's more anxious to deliver his people than his people are to be delivered. Do you believe that? It's true. But he's also patient that his character be developed in his people. 
but I can tell you that he won't wait a minute longer than he has to for his will to be accomplished. Nevertheless, the day of God's vengeance is just upon us, and the seal of God will be placed upon the foreheads of those only who sigh and cry for all the abominations done in the land. Read Ezekiel chapter 9 sometime. This prophecy applies to the days in which we live today. And unless we are crying out against all the sins that exist in these last days, especially by the way we live, we're not going to receive the seal of God. And if we don't, that will be tragic because we'll be forever lost. We need to understand that those who link up in sympathy with the world are as if they are eating and drinking with the drunken and will just as surely be destroyed. 1 Peter 3.12 says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ear is open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And evil has to do with disobeying what God has told us to do. You see, our own course of action will determine whether we will receive the seal of the living God or be cut down by the destroying weapons mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 9. Already a few drops of God's wrath have fallen upon this earth from time to time, but when the seven last plagues are poured out, then it's going to be forever too late to repent and find shelter, because no atoning blood will then be available to wash away our sin. And here's something else to think about. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads, even though they go to church every Sabbath day. Why? Because they had the light of truth, they knew God's will, they understood every point of Bible teaching, but they didn't have corresponding works. In other words, they talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. If they were familiar with prophecy and privileged with divine wisdom, they should have acted out their faith. Friends, it's time to be searching the Bible for ourselves upon our knees before God with the humble, teachable heart of a child if we would know what the Lord requires of us. And we don't have a moment to lose. And I'm preaching to myself here as well. If I neglect to follow the light God has given me, I will eventually go into darkness and satanic delusions. And the bad part of that is that I will lead others in the same path. And this goes for you too. Because we all have an influence for good or evil upon others. The Sabbath Sunday question is going to be the issue in the great final conflict that is even now developing. And if we live to see the Lord come, we are all going to act a part in this great drama. The majority of the Christian world is honoring a spurious Sabbath, which Satan has exalted as the sign of his authority. But God has set his seal upon the seventh day. Each institution, Sabbath or Sunday, bears the name of its author, a mark that shows the authority of each. And it is of vital consequence whether we bear the mark of God's kingdom or the mark of the kingdom of rebellion. For we acknowledge ourselves subjects of the kingdom whose mark we bear. It's important for us to know that Satan is the mastermind that plotted against the faithful in all ages past, and he is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and keep his commandments today. And he will do his very best to excite extreme anger against the minority who conscientiously refuse to accept the popular customs and traditions of men above the Bible. And in the end, men of high position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against God's people as they've done many times in the past. 
persecuting government rulers, even ministers and church members will conspire against the faithful remnant thinking they're doing God's service. Jesus warned that this would happen when he was here. With voice and pen, by threats and ridicule and everything at their disposal, the wicked will try to overthrow the faith of the righteous. By false representations and angry appeals, they'll stir up the passions of the people like they did during Jesus' trial. But not having a thus saith the Lord to bring against those who teach the Bible Sabbath, they will pass oppressive laws to supply the lack. That's always the way it's been. When those in authority can't persuade people to go along with their program, they'll take the only avenue that's left and that's force. And that force will come through the laws that they pass. That's the way a nation speaks, and that's the way the dragon speaks according to Revelation 13, 11. And because men in high positions in America want to hold on to their power and authority, legislators will eventually yield to the popular demand for a Sunday law. But those who fear God can't accept the law that violates the fourth commandment. And friends, this is the battlefield of the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Revelation 14.12 tells us plainly that just before Jesus comes, God's people will be commandment keepers. And since the Sabbath is one of the commandments, it follows that those who are not God's people at that time will be commandment breakers. And because the Sabbath is in question today, it will be the point of contention then. Because this issue isn't going away. It's been a point of contention within Christianity for nearly 2,000 years, and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. Also, Revelation 12:17 tells us that God has a remnant in the last days and the devil is angry with them because they keep the commandments. And so it's impossible to get away from this truth. And doesn't James 2:10 tell us that if we keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, we are guilty of breaking them all? Yes. God has revealed what's to take place in the last days, that his people may be prepared to stand against the wiles of the devil. And because we've been warned of the events that are just before us, are we to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting ourselves that the Lord will shelter us in the day of trouble? No. Yes, we are to be as men and women waiting for the Lord, but not in idle expectancy. It's no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with the cares of this life and things of minor importance. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness, and the leaders of this movement are concealing the true issue. And many who unite with them do not themselves see where the undercurrent is leading. The professors of the Sunday movement may seem mild and apparently Christian, but when the laws they pass come to fruition, they will reveal the spirit of the dragon. God's intention is that testing truth shall be brought to the front and become a subject of examination and discussion, even if it's through contempt placed upon it. The minds of the people must be agitated. And every controversy, every reproach, and every slander of the truth will be God's means of provoking inquiry and awakening minds that otherwise would sleep on. And I hope you're not one of those who are slumbering, friend. If you are, it's time to wake up because there's a work to do before human probation comes to an end. We must realize that our own salvation, as well as the destiny of other souls, depends upon the preparation we now make for the coming trial that awaits us. Do you have the zeal 
and piety and devotion that will enable you to stand when strong opposition is brought against you personally? The time is coming when we will be brought before councils and courts of injustice and every single position of truth that we hold as Sabbath keepers will be severely criticized. And the time that so many of us are now allowing to go to waste should be devoted to the preparation necessary for the approaching crisis we've been talking about. Friends, we are near the close of time. The judgments of God are already in the land. The Lord has given us warning about the events that are soon to take place. Light is shining from his word, and yet darkness covers the earth, and gross darkness the people, the Bible says. Isn't that amazing to you? It is to me. When the wicked shall say, peace and safety, then what happens? Sudden destruction comes upon them, and the Bible says they shall not escape. Why? Because it's too late. Too late. Wars and rumors of wars, destruction by fire and flood, and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and all the rest say clearly that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, by the way, is very near at hand. And also the troubles we see among the nations today will not cease until Jesus comes. And so don't be looking for a time of peace to come upon the world or that God's people are going to be whisked away by some secret rapture while the rest of the world gets a second chance to repent. We don't have time to go over this now, but there isn't going to be seven years of tribulation followed by the reign of Christ here on earth for a thousand years. This is another falsehood that has taken the Christian world captive. And the devil loves to have it so. Because if you think you'll get a second chance, or a second probation, Satan knows that people will procrastinate until it's too late. Besides, we are having our second chance right now. Did you know that? Adam and Eve blew our first chance, and the death of Christ gives us one more opportunity to get it right. And if we fail here, we're done. And you know what? I know there are some of you who will question the things that you have heard today, but I want to say that the things I've described will happen. And when they do, I pray the Holy Spirit will bring these things to your mind when you see their fulfillment so you will know what to do while there's still opportunity. Friends, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That doesn't mean we have to study 24-7. We don't want to become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But I think you would agree that most of us are not taking the time we need to become acquainted with God's word as we should. Well, we've used up our time once again. And I need to close, but please, take the time to think about the things we've discussed today that you might be found among the true and faithful when Jesus steps out of the heavenly sanctuary to pour out his wrath upon all those who are violating the Ten Commandments, which are still inside the Ark of his Testament in the most holy place. And may God help us to be his witnesses of the truth for these last days, that others might know what they need to do to find true happiness and eternal life while there's still time for repentance and forgiveness. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the time we've been able to spend together this morning. We want to thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that everyone as an individual study for themselves because someday they're going to have to answer for themselves before you. There is no question that we are living in the last days. And we know that the final movements are going to be rapid ones. And even now, we see how quickly things are moving along in our own country with the destruction of our Constitution and the understanding the Founding Fathers of this country had. Leaders today don't have that same understanding. 
at least the ones in power don't. But Lord, we realize also that uh, the change that needs to take place in this world has to be on an individual basis and in our own hearts. And so we pray that you would help us take every opportunity at our disposal to become better acquainted with you and your will for our lives in these last days. Thank you for being with us, and may we be faithful to live up to the light that we understand, because we know you're going to hold us accountable for that. We love you and we thank you for your great sacrifice on our behalf. And as you are preparing to step out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to deliver your people soon, may everyone within the sounding of my voice be ready for that great day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.